How would you, if you were to approach somebody that's never seen drifting or never heard about, how would you describe this? If I was to meet someone that didn't know drifting, even though it's really big right now, I'd probably tell them it's kind of like a form of art. Like you're sliding the car around the corner. It's like controlling like a spin out kind of. Like. It's just, I don't know how to describe it. It's just artistry with skid marks. It's, it's sliding a car, pushing it beyond its limits. That's, that's what it is. Nice. How would you describe drifting to someone that's never heard of it? Um, I'd say it's kind of like freestyle skateboarding in a car to me. I skateboarded for about 10 years and we were always kind of made fun of and things like that so people, I don't know, I'd say it's the freestyle skateboarding for cars. You get to take a car and do it when it's not supposed to do. You're supposed to squeal the tires and get it sideways and keep it that way and not run into something. Like to me that's that's drifting. Like it's freestyle skateboarding in your car. Like it's the only way. It's crazy as you can get but not lose. Uh I would call it probably ice skating on asphalt. It's the closest thing. Ice skating on asphalt. You like that? Pirouettes and everything? Oh yeah. yeah. Um it, it's very fluid. It's it's a different um, measurement of skill. Jay, what was it about drifting that made you want to do it? Uh, I think it was, I think my first, the first exhibition event I went to, I think it was a Falcon Drift show off, and I saw uh, guys like flying through and almost hitting the barricades, and I thought that was freaking awesome, so I was like, I gotta do it, I gotta try it someday. Yeah? yeah. Why drifting? Why not autocross or grip racing kind of attack? Uh, well, I started out, you know, uh, around, you know, racing with, uh, on tracks and professional stuff like that and uh, too expensive you gotta be way too competitive you know and uh, it costs a lot of money and drifting was kind of cheap you know starting out start out with a basic stock car and you know you're good to go
do you feel about the 886? Like, uh, what's that mean to you? Uh, the 886, uh, cool and older, older generation. Um, so it's a good car, it's good for beginners because it's low, pro low power. Uh, it was cheap, so a lot of people jumped on it at the beginning. Um, I think a lot of people are buying it right now because of initial D and all that stuff, but I mean, it's a good car to start off. Good solid platform. Yeah. Uh, the Hachiroku, uh, I'd say just because of its low cost, it's a solid platform from the beginning, front engine rear drive, lightweight, it's got a solid beam rear axle which makes it real responsive to, to suspension tuning. So if you're getting it sideways, if you get the tuning correct, it's a very capable car. Plus it's cheap, the parts are cheap, it's a Toyota so the motors last forever, they're readily available. So everything about the car kind of makes it more driftable, I guess. 86 was, uh, it was a lot, it was a good chassis for uh, the, the times, it had a lot of power. And uh, it's good rear wheel drive platform, front engine, and uh, it's just it's a good light chassis. It's a solid setup. Yeah. With the Corolla, it has a shorter wheelbase, so you know, versus a S13 or 240. Um, if you learn how to drift the Corolla, you can have fast reflexes, you know, because when the tail comes out, it'll come out fast. So when you learn how to drift the Corolla, that's why it's a good starting car. You learn how to drift the Corolla, it's easy. S13s are really readily available, still pretty low cost. Um, front engine and rear drive layout, just like the 86. So, I mean, probably, I mean, they're just, it's a cheap car, it's a good setup, it's a good driving setup. Like your driving position in, a, in an S13 or 14 is a good position. Your knee brakes real close to the steering wheel. They're real responsive to suspension tuning. It's a lightweight chassis. It's just a good solid car right from the get out. I, I think it's today's uh, Hachiroku, the S13, S14. They're uh, cheap. They're light cars. They have a good platform, you know, modern day suspension setup with the independent rear suspension and uh, S15 same thing we don't get them here unfortunately but uh, yeah and I guess with the newer generations they just got easier to drift because they, they improved on the design and just made it better. Well when you first start Build a drift car. I mean, I don't think you should go out and start buying all the most expensive parts, uh, parts you can. I just think you should, you know, start driving in stock, and then once you're able to control it like that, then upgrade what you think you need to upgrade. You know, if you think it oversteers too much or it understeers too much, then you buy the part that you know will help you fix that problem. And then from there, you know, stiffening up the suspension, definitely getting an LSD. Um, those are the main things. Every drift car needs an LSD. Um, you can drift one without it, but when you start getting serious about it, having an LSD is huge. Like, an LSD allows you to do things that you couldn't do unless you had a lot of power. So definitely an LSD. You want to have pretty advanced setup on your suspension. Uh, I run a really stiff rear end with a mildly stiff front end. So that allows the tail of the car to come out with more control. So I'd say definitely suspension tuning and LSD. Like those, those things are, are key. You gotta have that. If you can't tune your suspension, you can't adjust your setup, you're gonna be hampering yourself later on down the road. If you don't have an LSD, you're not gonna be able to pull the big, huge, long, smooth drifts that you see on the D1 and the option videos. Like if you can get a factory viscous, something like that, it's cool. If you can come up on the cache and get a, a two-way locker or something like that, you're going to have a lot more fun with it. It's going to allow you to do things in the car that you normally wouldn't be able to do. Well, for me, to tune a drift car, a lot of people say to get a LSD first. But in my opinion, I, you should just drift your car stock, see how you like it, and you know, from there, 
put on what you want, what you feel you need next. Like for me, uh, I started drifting my car stock. And even though I didn't have LSD, I, I could overcome it. So I got a suspension first. To, you know, because when you have no suspension, you have to work the steering wheel a lot. And uh, when I got suspension, it's more of a solid feel. So then from there, I got LSD. But that's the two main things. Suspension and LSD. Yeah, and then from there, you know, a little more power, a little more suspension, tie rods, tension rods. I'm Verena May. I'm a drifter and a drag racer. Right here is my drift car and um, basically I first got into drifting in 2002. I went to the Motion Picture Stunt Driving Clinic um, in LA and learned all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, they learned, I learned drifting, I learned fly 90s, 180s, reverse 180s, everything like you see in the movies and that's where I learned. Um, it was really cool because I had no experience beforehand and they called me Drift Girl. It was in a Caprice Classic with a foot e-brake. You know those old Caprice Classics are pretty square and uh, big and just just a hunk of drunk basically and it was so awesome. Um, back then there weren't too many events to go and try to um, drift or learn or hone my skills so I went into drag racing. I ended up getting my NHRA Pro Drag Racing license doing a 9.46 second quarter mile at 144 miles an hour and um, basically 
Drifting became hot this year. I got back into it, trained with James Bonderon at the Bonderon School, and here I am. Pretty much built this whole car. 90% um, of it I built myself, so it's a really cool thing. What most people don't know, I'm not only a model and a racer, I'm also sort of a mechanic. I work on my car, but I'm still learning a lot. So let's take a sneak peek under the hood. I just put in a new uh, black top SR20 motor. The only modifications done right here is the Koyo radiator, the Grady front mount intercooler. But what's really cool about it is a lot of people find that that the roll cage, that it's really interesting that the roll cage goes through the firewall and down here attached to the frame, which makes the front end really, really stiff. I get a lot of help from Nissan Motorsports, which I'm sponsored by for parts, so that helps a lot. And um, we're looking to do some upgrades after I get used to this engine. So let's take a look what else I have. For tires, you know, they're so important in drifting. We go through them so fast. I prefer my Yokohama tires. Um, I run the ABS ES100. The size on this one is a 225-45-17. Run them on the 17-inch Motegi wheels. Those right there are prototypes, so they're gonna soon manufacture some just like those so you can get them yourself. All right. Um, one of the really, really awesome things to are the rotor brakes. These four piston rotor brakes help me stop whenever I need to. Um, stop on the dime, the last minute car just stops before the wall. That's something I definitely need in drifting. You know how many cars hit the wall? Not with this. All right, now go into inside the car. You wanna take a look inside the car? Um, I gutted the car by myself. It took about three full days, 10 hour days. Um, Basically, everyone asked me, how do you get that sound dampener out of there? That's the stuff that just sticks to the very bottom of the car right after you take the carpet off. And I got some dry ice, I put it on there, just probably let it stay there for about 10, 20 minutes until it froze. Got a hammer and smacked it and it came right off. Um, all the other parts that kept um, sticking on, just got a little chisel and a scraper. Right here is the master kill switch. This is off. So if you don't want anybody to steal your car, you just take it off. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> that is, I guess, a little strategy. But when you're ready, you put the key in, you turn it, and that turns on the battery. Notice the battery wasn't in the engine bay. It's right here in the battery box. Okay, moving on. For the back end, I run the Cause LSD, which is awesome to help make the back end slide sideways. It's a little easier, you know, actually it's a lot easier than the stock LSD, so um, I switched it out. They're one of my sponsors. Tain suspension is great.
What's your favorite Japanese driver? You got a favorite driver out there? Um, probably had to be between Taniguchi and Kazama. Kazama just because of his antics and he's crazy out there doing what he wants to do. <laughs> but Taniguchi I like just because of his speed and his control and he just always looks so smooth when he's driving. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't really have a favorite Japanese driver. I've got respect for all of the Japanese professionals that you see out there, the guys on the videos, Kazama, Weo, uh, Taniguchi, uh, Takehiro Ueno, um, all those guys, Imamura, all those, all those guys are true professionals, they're excellent drivers, their car control is top notch, they're, a lot of them are buck wild and crazy, which I can appreciate, like to me that's, that's cool, they don't care who's watching or what's going on, like they're going to be themselves all the time, so to me that's, Highly respectable in my eyes. A lot of people have a problem with people that get crazy and do weird stuff, but to me, uh, I'm cool with it. I enjoy it. I'm kind of a weird cat myself, so it's cool with me. I like all those guys, definitely. Well, out of all the Japanese drivers, I you, I really used to like uh, Kaguchi, the way he uh, extended his drifts with the e-brake technique. I believe he's one of the first ones to start doing that. Um, but lately, I've been starting to pick up with uh, Tanaguchi, the HKS driver. Uh, it kind of sucks that he, he always gets second place, but yeah, he's the most consistent, I think. And I like the way he drives. What do you see drifting in like 10 years? Like, are you still going to be into it, do you think? Or? 10 years from now, the drifting scene, uh, I'm probably going to still be in it. Uh, it's, it's a hobby of mine. I'm really into it, so I'll still be in there. Be the old guy, disrupting and stuff. <laughs> but, uh, I'm sure it'll, it'll still, it's still going to be there. It's going to die down, I believe. Um, yeah. There's a lot of hype on it right now. I'm sure it'll die down, but then the original people will still be into it, and it'll still pick up new people. I think, I think it'll, you know, it'll get bigger. Maybe not so much commercial that'll kind of die down because that's kind of a bad type thing. But I think the track days will keep going. I think the, you know, the events, the exhibitions, the D1s. I think that'll still be going. I know. It's still going to be part of that. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, the future of drifting is uh, it'll probably be pretty big. I think it'll die down a little, like in the commercialism. But uh, I think there's still going to be a lot of hardcore drifters out there. You know, I don't think it's going to, you know, just go away. Passing fad. Yeah, I don't think it'll be a fad. There's there's a lot of hardcore people out there to keep it alive. I I'm hoping that drifting is just the next succession of motorsports. I want to see. Drifting on the Speed Channel. I want to be part of it. I want to be one of the sponsored guys you see sliding across your TV. I want to. I want to be there with the sport. So hopefully the sport grows and progresses and becomes more legitimized in the eyes of the masses. I say. I want to see it progress into a legitimate sport, respected sport. I want to see it just like NASCAR is these days. I want to see drifting. I want to be part of it.